including non-religious students who uh, value science and wish to promote secular values on our campus. And uh, we think that a great way to do that is with uh, a, a little event called Darwin Week. So uh, we're really excited about Darwin Week this year. Uh, you'll notice uh, in, in your seats you have these uh, rating cards. Uh, please fill it out. Uh, give us an idea of what you would like to see uh, and, and you know, what you'd like about uh, this year's talks. Uh, Darwin Week is co-sponsored by the Student Nature Society. Uh, and so we have a, a representative from the Student Nature Society to tell you a little bit about that group this evening. I'm Janelle Wooden, I'm Vice President of Student Nature Society, and we like to sponsor uh, Wednesday's Darwin Week because we like science and educating the public about the natural world and evolution. Our mission is to uh, foster the understanding and the appreciation of the natural world and to get the students involved in the community and the conservation. And um, we have students from all majors, so it's anyone who's interested in nature, conservation, or just the outdoors. Thanks for supporting us. <laughs> Our keynote speaker this evening is Dr. Mark Blumberg. Mark Blumberg is a behavioral neuroscientist and the F. Wendell Millen Professor at the University of Iowa. He received his bachelor's degree from Brandeis University in 1983, majoring in physics and philosophy. That year, he began graduate school at the University of Chicago, where he received his doctorate in biopsychology in 1988. After leaving Chicago, he began four years as a postdoctoral associate at Indiana University in Bloomington. In 1992, he moved to Iowa City to take a position at the University of Iowa. Blumberg has published over 100 scientific articles and chapters on a wide variety of topics, including sleep, abnormal behavior, animal mind, temperature regulation, and communication. He has received over $4 million in federal grant support, including an independent scientist award from the National Institute of Mental Health. In 1997, he received an early career award from the American Psychological Association, the APA, and in 2009, he received a Regents Award for Faculty Excellence from the University of Iowa. Currently, he serves as Editor-in-Chief of the APA journal, Behavioral Neuroscience. In addition to Freaks of Nature, What Anomalies Tell Us About Development and Evolution, Oxford University Press 2009, Blumberg has published two other books on, on uh, general science, Basic Instinct, The Genesis of Behavior, Basic Books 2005, and Body Heat, Temperature and Life on Earth, Harvard University Press 2002. He also co-edited the Oxford Handbook of Developmental Behavior and Neurosciences, Oxford Uni University Press, 2010. Blumberg was born in Washington, D.C. and grew up in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Please join me in welcoming <laughs> Dr. Mark Blumberg to Darwin Week 2011. and uh, for inviting me here tonight. And thanks to all of you for coming out on a cold Wednesday night uh, to hear me talk about, about this stuff. Um, can you all hear me in the back, first of all? Okay, good. If you, and also, I don't mind if you, if you have questions as I go through. I mean, if I, if I talk as I normally do, which is fast, um, you know, I can get through this in about 13 minutes. So um, <laughs> if you want to stop me uh, to ask a question, I, I have no, no problem with that. So uh, this, uh, slide that um, I start with is uh, one of my favorite slides ever because it, 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 uh, it kind of uh, encapsulates for me the, uh, some of the major issues that I think face us as thinkers, whether we are evolutionary thinkers or psychologists or biologists, uh, thinking about a complex world. Um, first, uh, what's kind of um, interesting is this little blurb here, which isn't very important, but you may be interested. It says, does our DNA compel us to seek a higher power? Believe it or not, some scientists say yes. Don't believe it, but, um, <laughs> but that's not really why I have this slide here. Um, what I really want to draw attention to is what this, what this image represents. What we have up here is uh, the double helix DNA uh, placed you know, right on the forehead, right, right, you know, meant to represent the mind of sorts. And then, of course, down here we have prayer. We have God, DNA, and the mind. And those things, you know, so for those of you who think that I'm, I don't know what you think I'm going to be on the evolutionary spectrum, but I'm going to, I'm going to be radical evolutionary here tonight. And I'm going to suggest, as I'll show you in, uh, throughout the talk, that many of us who consider ourselves to be evolutionists can be closet creationists without even knowing it. Uh, creationism pops up in all sorts of different areas. And that's, 
really the theme of my talk. So this is the image that you should keep in mind as we, as we go through this. So the summary of my talk is that intelligent design, creationism, is more than an anti-evolutionary perspective. It reflects a way of thinking that I call designer thinking. The designer thinking affects the way we think about many different phenomena. Protecting us, ourselves against designer thinking has been and continues to be crucial for scientific progress. And I will illustrate this perspective in two ways. Developing creations, I'll argue that even human inventions develop, and creating development. Biological development is a creative process. And anomalous creatures, what have been called throughout history as freaks and monsters, um, but I, you know, can help us to see how. But I want to point out that I use that term monster, that's in the title, but that is a scientific term. I'll tell you why. It, it, I'll tell you what it actually refers to a little bit later. Um, but you probably have already guessed what it refers to. I want to start by a little, a little bit of philosophy, where all this stuff starts. It starts with the argument from design. The argument from design is a very old argument. Uh, it's very famously uh, represented by William Paley, uh, who, you know, contemplating a watch as the story goes, wrote uh, in uh, a book on this subject, there cannot be a design without there cannot be a design without a designer, contrivance without a contriver. Design must have had a designer, that designer must have been a person, that person has got a compelling argument, right? I uh, drove our thinking for, for millennia, really, this very basic argument. You see complexity, you can't understand complexity, you have to resort to a simple explanation. In this case, God, which is not a simple concept, but it's a single word. Not unlike gene or mind, but it's, it, it serves the purpose of filling in our doubt filling in our confusion when we, compl when we confront complexity in the world. Now, as, we, as many of you know, perhaps all of you, Darwin defeated the argument design using a particular uh, rhetorical uh, flourish. He said, you know, let's think about an eye. And he says, to suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances, could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree. Classic Darwin, he sets you up and then he knocks you over because he basically says it's absurd and then in the next few pages he says exactly why it's not absurd. And the way he broke it down, one way anyway, to defeat the argument for design which Darwin relied upon was instead of thinking about, you know, sorry, instead of just focusing on the complex thing, let's go back and look at the origins. And if you go back and you look at the history of eyes, you find that they come in all sorts of forms mere indentations on the surface of the skin with little uh, uh, areas that are sensitive to light find, find, uh, in which then over time, over evolutionary time, in different species, you find cups are forming, you find that the cup, uh, like, a, like old pinhole cameras, you start to develop a pinhole, you might add a little stuff in there, it starts to get spherical, and over time you start to get things that look like regular eyes. And by looking at the, uh, the intermediate forms, that's how one way to go about defeating the argument for design. But it's not the only way. One of my favorite philosophers is David Hume, in a wonderful book that I recommend to, um, to everyone. Written in 1776, the year of his death, death, he tucked it into his drawer, it was to be uh, read after he died, and it was. And he says, he's sort of talking in the, in the words of somebody else, but he was sort of making fun of the argument for design. For all we know, he says, our world was only the first rude essay of some infant deity who afterwards abandoned it, ashamed of his lame performance. <laughs> this is the argument from imperfection. Okay, that's the opposite of the argument from design. You point out the imperfections in the world, and if God is perfect, God should not be creating perfect, imperfect things. So that's the second way. Intermediate forms is one, but the argument from imperfection is the other. The late Stephen Jay Gould said it this way. Odd arrangements and funny solutions are the proof of evolution, paths that a sensible God would never tread, but that a natural process, constrained by history, follows perforce. One of the classic examples of imperfection, I'm sure you're all aware, is the blind spot in the retina. You would never design an eye this way if you were starting from scratch. But the eye has a history, that history cannot be undone, and so we see that imperfection in our, in our bodies today. There are many, many examples. This is one. Uh, and the way I, I like to talk about it is that God is engineering as Michael Brown is a hurricane relief. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had to wait for that. Just, I mean, the problem is we're getting so far past Katrina that we're sort of forgetting you know, who Michael Brown was. Poor guy. Anyway, nonetheless, despite all of the successes of evolutionary theory, uh, the sky is really falling. Creationists are everywhere. My argument is that creationism is a framework for explaining the origins of the universe and life on our planet. But it also reflects a style of thinking, as I said, designer thinking, that has had an impact far beyond the evolution debate. 
Design and thinking has played a role in many important issues, including learning, human invention, and development, including the nature and function of DNA. Design and thinking impedes our understanding of animal behavior as much as it does our understanding of animal form. Okay. So, <coughs> what explains the complexity of the human eye? I already told you how Darwin you know, went after that. Design is the way a designer would think about it. A designer thinking person would say, well, of course, design is the action of divine creation. That's the argument. How do you explain an eye? Well, that's our only way. No, not when you look at the origins of eyes. You come up with a very different solution. What explains the complexity of the human mind? Well, that's simple, right? Design through the action of consciousness. Okay. What explains, let's get specific here, the spooky similarities of identical twins reared apart? That's easy. Design through the action of genes. Now this is a very common thing, and you've all probably heard about all this work with twins reared apart, how incredibly similar they are. And one author who's very well known, perhaps to many of you, is Stephen Pinker. <coughs> and Stephen Pinker, in the language instinct, uh, describes two very famous twins, these, the, uh, the Jim twins as they're called, Jim Springer and Jim Lewis were raised by different families in Ohio, with Jim Springer being raised by his biological parents. After their reunion at the age of 39, researchers noted that each of the Jim twins had been married twice, first to a Linda, then to a Ben. Their sons were named James Allen and James Allen. As children, they each had a pet dog named Toy. When they grew up and got married, each twin's family vacationed in the same beach area of Florida and they drove to their vacation spot in light blue Chevrolets. <laughs> and both twins smoked Salem cigarettes and occasionally drank Miller Lite beer. How can you avoid concluding that genes control these things? Well, Stephen Pinker concludes that that's the fact where we have to go. Many people are skeptical of such animals. <laughs> are the parallels just coincidences? The overlap that is inevitable when two biographies are scrutinized and not the tale? Clearly not. Researchers are repeatedly astonished by the spooky similarities they discover in their identical twins reared apart, but that never appear in their fraternal twins reared apart. Think about that. Okay? So what Pinker wants us to buy, and what all the people who purveying these twin studies want us to buy, is that somehow our genes can control how many times we engage in an institution called marriage, and how many times, uh, and who's our, who our wives are going to be called, our husbands and that we're going to name our children English words, right? In the same exact possible way, because there must be a gene for who you're going to name your, your kid if you happen to be in England, or in an English-speaking country. And as children, it's also going to affect that you're going to have a domesticated dog, and it's going to affect what you're going to call them, and it's going to, it's going to affect what kind of car you're going to drive, and your preference for the color, and where you go on the planet that we call Florida, and it's going to, and, and it's going to affect whether or not you want to smoke cigarettes and drink like beer and what brand, okay? Now most of us see these anecdotes and we say, yeah, okay, that seems reasonable, right? You hear it in the popular press and you say, of course. This is, this is snake oil. This is pure and simple snake oil. Genes don't do this. Genes don't have control over any of these sorts of things. It's, it's absurd. But what's happened with the molecular revolution, as, as wonderfully creative and important as it has been, is that it's generated these fanciful notions that instead of God, we're just going to have genes do all the talking for us. Right. So this isn't language instinct. I pick on that because it's my favorite. But you know, there are many others. There was the Bell Curve, came out in 1994, same basic idea. Mark Hauser, uh, Moral Minds, The Faith Instinct by Nicholas Wade, Living With Our Genes. I mean, these books are all over the place. Of course, these books have their the other side. People are fighting on the other side, too. So we have a book called Not In Our Genes, very famous book, very influential was I when I was in grad school, and Nature Be a Nurture, The Triple Helix, my own book, plug, plug. Um, <laughs> uh, Defending G, I mean, all these books, so we have these battling, battling books, okay, trying to figure out, you know, what is the appropriate way to think about these very complex things. So the question is, are there really good and bad genes? Well, there are lots of arguments about good and bad genes. The math gene, the, the guy gene, the genius gene, gay genes, math genes, guy genes, depression genes, schizophrenia gene, autism gene, genius gene. And sometimes if you have all three of these, and you get in. Remember <laughs> 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 who this is? Is anybody in the movie? Animal <laughs> Yes, okay, good. So, um, so anyway, uh, you know, fat truck is stupid, there's no way to go through life. Anyway, so. Uh, <laughs> about all this? Is this really an accurate depiction of complex phenomena like these things represent? 
Well, let's look at one, the fat chance. You know, here's a book that talks about it. Now, in the next slide, I have a, an audio clip, and I'm just warning you right now, if you don't like foul language, close your ears now, earmuffs, you know, because uh, it's foul, okay? So, but it's from a mother talking into a phone. So if anybody has problems with this, I'm warning you. And my point here is, uh, has to do with how important these things to us. Why do we like these ideas about genes controlling us? Well, it has something to do with blame and guilt and all sorts of other things like that. Here was a, an ad that was placed in People magazine, and it shows you know these cartoon characters. It says, there is no childhood obesity epidemic. And you can't see this, but it says, we just need better role models. This is an extreme environmental approach to say, you know, why is there obesity? Well, look around our country. Look at the fried food. Go to Europe, you don't see nearly as much, right? But in the United States, we have tremendous problems with obesity. Well, where does it come from? This ad, these are fitness people, are arguing that we just have a bad lifestyle. One mother did not like this. Here she goes. I am calling from Orlando, Florida. I subscribe to People magazine. I just got um, my most recent copy, and I saw an ad um, about you. And it says there is no childhood obesity epidemic. And it has pictures of a cartoon pictures of a fat mom and a fat dad and a fat kid. And your organization is called Coalition of Angry Kids. I am going to fucking sue you. <laughs> I'm a marathon runner and so is my husband. We are health food freaks. We are skinny. I work for Weight Watchers. My husband weighs 145 pounds at age 55, height 5'10". We have an adopted child who lives in our home, who eats what we eat, and she actually eats far, 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 far less than any of her peers. She has been to every kind of doctor in America to find out. She has what they call the fat gene. So when you, she sees ads like this, I don't want her to be angry at her mom and dad. I want her to be angry at pe fucking people, bigots like you. You need to call me. <laughs> people do not make this thing. What? Who was the recipient of this call? The Anytime Fitness? Anytime okay. Fitness, yeah. So, Obviously, she's upset. Um, why is she upset? She doesn't want to be blamed for her obese child. Now, what are the point? What are the important parts? You know, the environment is healthy. The child is adopted. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with us biologically. You know, she's eating what we eat. She doesn't want to be angry at her parents, right? By seeing these types of ads. This is sort of what's driving many of the ways we think about these complex issues because emotionally, or, or whatever, you have, whatever the motivation is, we don't really want. To, to believe that we're responsible for things when they go bad, especially if we're parents, right? We want our kids to all, we want kids to be happy, uh, healthy, but we and when they're not, we don't want them to blame us. So this is one dimension to what's going on with uh, how we think about things like genes. Well, in reality, there are no good and bad genes. Genes are just part of a system. And one way we know this scientifically is a phenomenon called the norm of reaction. Let's say you take a bunch of plants, and these, are, these plants are simply you know, seven different types of plants, and we grow them in a low elevation. You'll see, ah, look, there's a tall plant, here's a short plant. This must have a tall gene, this must have a short gene. Well, not really, because now we go into a medium elevation situation, and we find that same plant, you know, a clone of that plant is now the shortest plant. So a tall gene here becomes a short gene here, and a short one here stays short. This is a medium height, and it gets tall. Now let's go to a higher elevation. Well, now this one's tall again. And now everything's sort of inverted. This is a fact. This is called the normal reaction. It's a fact of how genes get expressed in different environments. There are no good genes and bad genes. There are just, there's just DNA being expressed in biological organisms. And our goal as biologists, uh, or biopsychologists, or whatever we are, is to understand this complexity throughout these different environmental situations in which organisms find themselves being developed. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to say, well, what about you know, this gene and that gene? Yeah, there are a few exceptions, but those are, the, those are the exceptions. They are not the rule. So what explains the ingenuity of human invention? Okay, so we've talked, tackled these other issues you know, lightly. What about things that we really, really care about? Us, our own creativity, our insight, 
our ability to solve problems. Is that also, can we at least hold that as a, as a, as a last bastion that's, that's divorced from these you know, sort of mechanistic uh, uh, ways of thinking about the world? Well, you know, maybe, maybe not. So here's a, a mouse trap, a classic example of a design feature uh, of our world. Everybody would say that these things are invented. And then over here is a diagram from a book by a guy named Michael Behe, who, was one of the, who wrote a book called Darwin's Black Box. He was the, one of the major forces in the intelligent design movement. And you know, when, when most of us uh, look at these uh, things, you know, we, we, we want to understand you know, where they come from. Michael Behe would argue, well, this is design. This is, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you what this was. This is supposed to be the flagellum of a bacterium that he drew in such a way as to, as to bring it home to you that it's, it looks like a, like a blueprint on an engineer's desk, right? So this flagellum, this biological organism that he's, he has recaptured as, a, as, a, as an artifact, uh, he would compare it to a mousetrap. He'd say, these are created by man, and these are designed by God. Same exact thing. Now evolutionists, most evolutionists, have, have confronted this problem by switching the words a little bit. They say, okay, this is still design, but this is apparent design. This is organic. This doesn't really qualify as design. Well, here's uh, somebody that we, would, you know, most evolutionists would, would be looked up to as an icon of evolutionary thinking, and that's Richard Dawkins. And he writes that the world is divided into things that look design, apparent design, like birds and airliners, and things that don't. Um, yeah, things that don't, rocks and mountains. Things that look design are divided into those that really are design, submarines and tin openers, and those that aren't, sharks and hedgehogs. Okay? What he's arguing is, is that things look designed, they may not be designed, but the thing is for him as an evolutionist, this really is designed, this is only apparently designed, and that's a, that is a distinction between things that we do and things that are done in the outside world. Okay? What does Dawkins mean, Dawkins mean by really are designed? All appearances are the contrary, he's written, the only watchmaker in nature is the blind forces of physics. A true watchmaker has foresight. He designs his cogs and springs and plans their interconnections with a future purpose in his mind's eye. Is this an accurate description of human invention, or is this just, just designer thinking coming from an unlikely source? Okay, so I'm basically standing in front of you telling you that one of the world's greatest evolutionary thinkers is himself behaving in creationist thinking. When it comes to humans, and that's exactly what we do. When it comes to humans, we all, almost all of us, even Richard Dawkins, become creationists. Let me give you some examples. Here's the Fosbury flop. This is an example uh, that uh, Ed Wasserman, who, who's coming here tomorrow, and I have written about. And um, this is a, a classic situation of behavioral design in humans, uh, where prior to Fosbury in 1968 at the Olympics in Mexico, all people who engaged in the high jump did either a scissor, scissor kick or a belly roll. Right? And then all of a sudden, on the international stage comes Fosbury, Dick Fosbury, who does the flop, breaks all the records, and within a few years, almost everybody was doing the flop. Complete radical change, you could call it a mutation, in the way people behaved in Olympic or in track and field uh, situations. Where did, where did it actually come from? The flop, Dick Fosbury himself wrote, developed in competition and was a reaction to my trying to get over the bar. He actually had a very lanky body, and he had trouble doing the other standard ways of, uh, of uh, jumping over the high bar. I never thought about how to change it. I'm, I'm sure my coach was going crazy because it kept evolving. I believe that the flop was a natural style, that I was just the first, and I was just the first to find it. Well, he obviously was a natural style that took over. People still do it, you know, 42 years later. But there are really lots and lots of examples like this in the world. You know, if you go back in the world of engineering, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, for those of you who are old enough to remember this bridge, built terribly, oscillated like crazy, and fell apart um, because the designers didn't take into account certain features of that environment. The Hyatt Regency walkway collapsed, killed lots and lots of people because the designers, actually two separate groups of designers, uh, failed to recognize certain stresses in the system that they were doing. Um, and of course, the Challenger disaster, uh, the space shuttle uh, disaster, about, I guess, 30 years ago now, uh, is another example, which basically came apart. Here's Richard Feynman explaining uh, the problem, why it actually happened. Um, these are huge disasters, you know, monstrous disasters. And you might ask yourself, well, is this really how you know, all the little bits come apart? I mean, yeah, okay, so things can go wrong, big deal. 
but is that perhaps, you know, we might wonder whether or not all of our inventions really come about through this trial and error process. And in fact, Thomas Edison argued as much. He said, famously, inventors fail their way to success. But more importantly, there's an engineer today who actually does scholarship in this area, Henry Petrosky, and he talks about the evolution of useful things. And he writes that artifacts do not spring fully formed from the mind of some maker, but rather become shaped and reshaped through the principally negative experiences of their users within the social, cultural, and technological context in which they are embedded. In other words, our inventions are not the products of insight, foresight, creativity. Sure, those things can play a role, but the driving force is mistake and error and correction and mistake, error, correction through the process of, of these, um, of this, um, of, the, of, our, of our technological history. And I'm going to give you one more example of this, uh, something the most simple thing you could ever think of, eating, right, utensils. I just think how easy must it have been to invent a freaking fork, <laughs> you know? How easy must that have been? But actually, Petrosky goes through the history of tableware, right? This is not very technological, right? It's not really a space shuttle. But Starting hundreds and hundreds of years ago, actually people started with knives and they would just stab food, but a knife trying to eat meat, for example, which is what primarily what they're eating with a knife, you know, that's very awkward, the meat spins, you know, things, bad things happen. So they came up with the two tie, uh, tie and fork. Now that didn't really work so well, it grabbed the meat a little bit too well. So they came up with the three tie fork. They did that for about 100 years. Then they came up with the four tie fork. And actually there was a flirtation with the five tie fork. Um, but you're going to see that over time, you can't have too many tines because your mouth, human mouth, is only so big. You can't have a 38 tine fork <laughs> because you're just going to stab yourself in the face. All of, this, all of this was about conveying food to your mouth without touching it. That's all it involved. It was just about not getting your fingers greasy, right? And it took hundreds and hundreds of years for the perfect fork to arise. And then what happened? Wow, once we settled it on that, look what happened. You know, we've got shrimp forks, we've got cake forks, we've got soup spoons, we have, you know, everything for serving different types of cake. We have fish forks, I mean fish knives, I mean, with that little notch on top that I never understood. I mean, everything that, that you can imagine, right? Diversity, the evolution of diverse human interactions with food. But, you know, I'm a biologist, so I'm interested in forks and knives and things like that, but I'm actually more interested in the natural world. And we have the same kind of diversity in the natural world, um, tremendous amounts of, of diversity. And this slide has is, is got different kinds of diversity in it. So let me walk you through some of them, all right? There's an elephant, embryo. That's a pretty strange animal, but it's a, you know, it's a species. This is an anglerfish. That is the female anglerfish. That is the male. <laughs> <laughs> He's basically an outboard sperm donator, right? That's what he does, he fuses, his, his circulatory system binds with hers, and then he delivers sperm, and then he just basically gets, you know, he's, you know, he's a caboose. <laughs> um, this is an embryonic uh, star-nosed mole, one of the weirdest creatures. This is actually a star-nosed mole when it's out in the world. This is its nose here, the claws, right? This is a blind mole rat. This is a jerboa, which is a rodent. Okay, so these are strange animals in the world that we think of as perfectly normal because they are independent species, right? But of course, within species, we have a different kind of diversity. We have twinning, in which one twin is born inside of another person. And these folks can go ahead and live all their lives together, and these legs will move around, but this guy is basically pinned uh, to the other. Here's uh, di dichrosopia in a human infant born about three or four years ago now. This is cyclopia in a, in a kitten. This is dicephalus, the turtle. Dicephalus, the British grass snake. Here's a four-legged chick, right? Here's a dog I'll get to in a bit. Here's Johnny Eck I'll get to in a bit. This is a different kind of diversity. This is the kind of diversity that, from an evolutionary standpoint, has been ignored, considered unimportant, and has just been thrown out as, as uninteresting to biology for many, many years. So very briefly, I don't want to go into a lot of scholarship junk about, you know, the evolutionary stuff, but it is Darwin Week, and there's Chucky. And I said, <laughs> that's your favorite picture, it's my favorite picture of him, too. And, you know, traditional Darwinism, as Darwin got interpreted, a lot of this happened after his, his death, but 
you know, Darwin was primarily an incrementalist for a very variety of reasons. And the meaning that, that change that happens in evolution has to be slow. Okay? And, the, and a lot of the animals I just showed you are, are sort of go against that, right? They're not really incremental. They seem more than that. And, and one of the tenets of neo-Darwinism, which is what we've, we've been living with for the last 100 years, well, 80 years or so, is that natural selection is an external force that acts on randomly produced variants that, are, that are arise through genetic mutation. If you have animals, there's a mutation, a little bit of variability, external forces select based upon which ones of those are more fit, right? Which ones have more offspring, really, and who survive longer. That's, you know, that's, that's the basic fight. But Darwin considered the animals I showed you on the previous slide to be mere monstrosities, no role in evolution whatsoever. But he was not, you know, this was not the final word. So, for example, uh, William Bateson in the 1880s uh, um, and 90s uh, took a different approach. He was not a strict Darwinist, but he was still an evolutionist. And he thought that developmental variants could arise discontinuously and for a variety of reasons. And he focused on the internal mechanisms of development. And this is coming back in gangbusters in the last 30 years in the form of what's now known as EVO-DEVO, evolutionary developmental biology, and, and, and understanding of things like Hox genes and other things like that, which I won't go into. But basically what you need to understand about this is there are some animals that just seem to have these strange things about them. A fly that has, uh, this is called a bithorax fly, it has two sets of wings, okay? But they're both functional. This is, you know, most flies have one set of wings, but they have two. They still fly around. And then you have these other uh, subflies that instead of having an antenna up here on the head, they grow feet. These are not continuous variants. These are discontinuous variants. From an antenna to a foot is not a continuous variant, right? <laughs> but these sorts of things, Bateson was considered a crank, and he was largely ignored. But he is now being proven correct to have focused on the importance of these sorts of discontinuous processes in development. They've taught us a lot about development. Do they teach us about evolution? Well, Mary Jane West Everhard uh, has written a book recently, about eight years ago now. She praises anomalies. She writes that ours is not a world of uniformly tiny, mutationally based, or exclusively quantitative variants. Rather, it is one full of recurrent developmental anomalies that vary in accord with the genetic makeup of individuals and also with their environmental circumstances. Unusual variation is abnormal, at least in the sense of being rare, and sometimes even grotesque. But anomalies represent new options for evolution. The options that anomalies represent are embedded within the mechanisms of development. So I wrote a book to, to explore this very issue, and my argument was that monsters help us to understand development as a creative process. And if we only study the normal or the typical, we feed the very same illusion that gets creationists in so much intellectual trouble. What binds the anomalous and the typical is a common link to developmental process. So this is, the, this is basically a diagram, a cartoon of what development really is. You have the sensory world, you have the genetic world, you have physical influences, temperature, oxygen, gravity, right? They're all feeding in this black box of development and outcomes behavior, and then behavior feeds back and influences our sensations, our gene activity, and our physical influences. And if we unpack that black box and we look inside of it, we see lots and lots of cells and interactions and things like that. But I want to point out that genes are in here inside of the cell and behavior's up here. Genes do not affect behavior directly ever. That's why that story about twins reared apart has got to be wrong. Genes do not influence behavior directly. They, get, they only have their effects locally on cells and the interactions among cells. And if we're going to understand something as complex as behavior, we have to get down inside the organism and understand how what genes actually do. There is an approach to thinking about these things. It's called developmental systems theory. And developmental systems theory focuses on the processes of development. It isn't just interested in static genes and static behavior or static form. It's interested in all the parts in between. The complexity can only be unraveled by looking at, at time, looking at moment to moment to moment to moment, because that's how development actually happens. It happens in milliseconds, nanoseconds, you know, seconds, days, months, years. It does not happen, right, instantaneously. Instantaneously is creationism. So let's look at development as construction. Context sensitivity and contingency. Joint determination by multiple causes. 
distributed control. These are all the tenets of developmental systems theory. I'm just going to give you some examples of these, and um, hopefully uh, it will become clear. Let's look at development as construction. Neither traits nor representations of traits are transmitted to offspring. Instead, traits are made, they are reconstructed in development. Let me give you an example. Human upright walking. Human bipedalism. Is it instinctive? Is it in the genes? Well, if anything, it should be in the genes. It should be one of the determining, one of the most glorious features of the human species, our ability to walk upright, considered one of the most important steps in human evolution. Okay. Let's take a look at Johnny Yang. Can you see this? It's going to be. It's Johnny Yang. Can you can't see it. Can you see it? Can you see it? He has a condition called amenia. His legs were born in a very short, foreshortened uh, way. And Johnny Ann, can you get these up there? Yep. This is from a movie, that's better, called Freaks, classic, 1932. Hold your beers and watch this movie. And, uh, and that's him, so you can see him walking on his hands. He was an actor. And he also performed in other sorts of places. But you can see how wonderful he is as a walker. Watch him take these stairs. You know? Now, his legs were just, they were foreshortened, like I said. They were there. He, he used to say he was cut off the waist when he was alive. Um, so that's him walking. Pretty amazing. If you can't hear what he's saying, he's saying, come on, the, the, the bearded lady's baby's born. I, he must have had children say that. Anyway, that's Johnny Yak. He's a hand walker. There are other examples. So let's look at, let's leave it up for one second, I'll just show this next film. Here it is, um, uh, um, why am I blanking on the name? It doesn't matter. Yeah, it's a slow dog, and I wrote about it, and then I'm like, can't remember his name also. Look at Faith, Faith, born in Oklahoma City. Watch Faith. Born without functioning hormones. Now, look at the curvature of the spine. Look at the change in this animal. This animal has changed from a normal dog. Here he is going shopping. Um, <laughs> see the curvature of the spine? This animal isn't just a freak that learned to walk on its hind legs. This animal grew into its deformity. Right? The first case that evolutionary biologists got interested in was actually a Dutch goat uh, born just before World War II and died in a car accident. I'm uh, <laughs> trying to get pictures of that goat. I, I, I contacted them, everything in the hall, and I couldn't get, get through them. There were no pictures. But anyway, this is fake to talk. Okay? Achieving in one lifetime what is considered to be one of the great achievements of all of human history. Okay? Let me give you one more example. You can turn around. A jerboa. Here's a jerboa as an adult. Here he is in real life. And if we step back, you know, these animals have long legs. They are upright walkers. They are hoppers. Uh, if we trace them back, you know, instead of we'll go the opposite direction of normal development, and we'll look at them at 41. And this is a stage of their life where they're very awkward. You know, this is the stage where it's kind of like walking around in flippers, right, on a, on a, on a dock or near a pool. You know, you're trying to angle your feet. But this is, the, this is, a, this is an actual species, right? I mean, this is an actual normal species that has to walk like this. You go back farther and you realize, you know, this is a long leg ter a period when they are basically just pulling themselves around by their forelegs. But you get back to day one when they're born, they look like every other room. They look like the rats that I have in my lap. They grow long legs, and they learn how to walk with those long legs as they get longer, right? And eventually, they're able to get up on those legs, hop around, and walk. Now, where's the instinct? If I asked you before this talk, you know, are you comfortable with calling that a bipedal instinct? You'd probably say, sure. But now I ask you, do you feel comfortable calling this a bipedal instinct? <laughs> do you feel comfortable calling this a hand-walking instinct? But this designation of instinct is reserved for evolved behaviors expressed by well-formed normal creatures. Anomalies help us to appreciate universal developmental processes with a clarity that is lost by focusing on typical well-formed organisms alone. The freaks the monsters, they break us out of our, of our well-trodden ways of thinking about 
biology or anything else that's related to these, to these processes that get us to think more broadly about what are the actual things that are going on developmentally to make it possible for these three different animals to do what they do naturally. And this is just as natural. All people with amelia walk like that. And if we go into the brain of these animals and we actually ask how are the brains organized, we find that the brains reflect the bodies. The brains are a reflection to a large degree of the bodies that these animals have. So a blind mole rat has these ridiculously ugly teeth like this, and these are, these are, these are digging animals. They dig burrows, so they have very large teeth. And if you go in and you map the cerebral cortex and you draw a picture according to what you find, this is how much cortex a cartoon, but it's, it's meant to represent how much cortex is actually devoted to the teeth. It's this much. Hands, teeth. I mean, the trunk, who cares about the trunk, right? This is the focus of these animals. And if you go in and you look at the star-nosed mole, they have these wonderful uh, appendages in the front. This is what they use to forage, a lot of activity, and these enormous claws. And this is the amount of cortical tissue that's devoted to the star. This is how much is devoted to the paw. Again, trunk, tail, less important. Use it, your brain reflects it. That's what we know about neuroscience. You say, well, wait a second, maybe evolution just created brains that reflect the bodies. But well, we know that's not entirely the case, at least. So let me show you an example. Here's a cortex of, a, of an animal. I'll tell you what it is in a second. When we look at cortices in animals, cerebral cortex, the uppermost part of your rostral part of your, of your brain, this is a pattern. See these stripes here? This is a pattern that's very typical of mammals. These are called ocular dominance columns. It doesn't really matter. This is typical of reptiles. No sharing of information between the left and right eye. But this is one brain, half mammal, half reptile. How did they do that? They did it by making a three-eyed frog. They embryologically planted a, a third eye in between. This eye ended up growing uh, axons into the one side of the brain, but not the other. When it grew into one side of the brain, it created this competition and therefore these columns, and the other eye produced these non-columns. Mammal on this side, reptile on that. Okay? Who put that in there? Hmm? Who put that in there? Scientists. Not God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we know experimentally that we can produce these types of weird creatures and they can end up, and so what we know about this is, if we just saw this, we would say, oh, this is obviously genetically programmed brain organization. No, it's not. It arises through competition from the peripheral sensory system. And this is true in many, in all the sensory systems that have been looked at. Let's look at things like context sensitivity and contingency. The notion that the significance of any one cause is contingent upon the state of the rest of the system. But things, causes are not isolated from other causes. Multicausality, another way of saying this, every trait is produced by the interaction <coughs> of many developmental resources and distributed control. No one type of interacting. Interacting controls development. Control does not exist anywhere in the system because it's a system. Very hard thing for us to understand, but it's true. So let me give you some examples. The next slide may be gross for some of you, so I'm going to give you a little bit of warning. If you're really queasy, don't look. Now I know what all of you want, right? Um, so here is a cyclopic kitten. I showed you this before. Here's a diprosopia kitten. Uh, this is a widening of the face. This is a lessening of the widening of the face. It's actually the whole face that fails to divide. Okay, the next one is going to be cyclopia in a human. Be careful. Okay, this is what a human being looks like with cyclopia. This is what a human being looks like with the same condition. Same developmental processes in both. Okay? This is Obviously, cyclopic infants do not, um, if they make it to turn, they're usually still born. Um, so these phenomena are universal among you know, these animals, right? It's not just a human condition. It's not just a kitten condition. It's, it's a condition of development. Where does it come from? OK. About 100 years ago, um, a guy by the name of Wilder tried to put all this stuff together in one slide. And this is, this is how he drew it. So we, we're going to go left to right, left to right, left to right for progression. Extreme cyclopia, followed by another form. It's a little bit of widening of the face, a little widening, the nose comes in, two eyes with two eyes. Here come, these are sort of more of the faces that we're more familiar with. Extreme sort of widening of the face, extreme widening of the face. That prosopia comes in, extreme, very, very extreme, okay? From cyclopia to diprosopia. Let's look at 
let's take a look at these two right here. Anybody wondering about this? <laughs> what is that? A nostril. A nostril. Right. Well, it is. Right? I mean, because there's nothing here. So it's that. The nose. Hmm. So what happens? Well, what we know happens is this. When the eyes are developing, they start off as a field of cells. That field of cells runs across the entire face. At some point, there is a signal that causes an opening to be placed in the eyes. And the cells, not this thing itself, the cells that would have become this thing, um, migrate down to the middle of the face, and they become a nose. Widening of the eyes, that's an opening in the eye field, followed by this. What's interesting about that is this. When those cells develop on the forehead, they look like this. When they develop here, they look like this. That's context, contextual contingency, right? Where you grow determines <coughs> what you are going to be, even at the cellular level, right? Proboscis, nose. Well, where else do we see proboscis in nature? Hmm. Elephants, right? Look how similar these things are. Now, I'm not going to argue that this is the exact same thing. Elephants have evolved trunks with muscles and control, all sorts of things, right? I'm not arguing that they're the exact same thing, but I'm saying this is a pretty remarkable resemblance, don't you think? Nobody's ever looked at the evolutionary uh, of the development of the trunk and where these cells divide and how similar they are to this, but that is way too much of a coincidence for my taste. And it makes you wonder about the linkages between anomalies within a species and anomalies across species, because in the world of species, trunks are pretty freakish, right? Elephants are strange animals. That's why kids want to see them in the zoos, right? Because they're strange. They're cool, but they're strange. Well, wow. And you can make these things. You can make these things molecularly too. Here's a here's a mouse in which the gene has been knocked out. It's on a hedgehog, and this mouse you can barely see it, but has a huge proboscis. And this is a this is an embryonic mouse. This is an embryonic elephant. You know, I'm not saying they look identical, but you know, whatever. They kind of look similar. All right, so there are linkages between development and evolution, right, that, that standard evolutionary theory discarded for all sorts of reasons I won't go into, but I'd be happy to answer questions about it. But the history of evolution of the 20th century is a history of evolution without development, for the most part. It's changing now over the last 30 years. Here's another freakish animal, a turtle. What's the, I, I flipped them on, I mean, I have this picture of them because I, I love these, these turtles. What's weird about these turtles? Does anybody notice? I mean, other than the fact that they have a shell, no which ribs. is pretty weird. What? No ribs. No ribs. <clears throat> no ribs. Where are the ribs? The ribs are inside the shell. You know, that's where the ribs are, inside the shell. And what happens with the development, the evolution of the, of the shell, is that the turtle, uh, the ribs, instead of growing uh, inside of the girdle, the shoulder girdle, they grew outside. And something about bone growing in skin of the back, rather than curving around, created changes in the local skin <coughs> that produced a shell. So you might say that the shell was a mutation caused by something that causes changes in the development of the shell, but what it really was was the evolution of where you grow the ribs, right? Ribs grow one place, you don't get a shell. Ribs grow another place, you get a shell. Context, sensitivity. Okay, let's take another look. One other uh, idea, interchangeability. The notion that genetic and environmental factors are interchangeable in the control of development. Here are two more uh, problems that humans have. Um, mirror image duplication is one of them. This is a phenomenon in which the, rib, the, the hands grow in a mirror image way. Okay, these are functioning hands, of course. We don't really know the cause of this. It's presumed to be by a mutation. But this is a frog. An X-ray of a frog limb, identical, identical process. Again, nothing special about humans. What's it's common development. But this is not caused by a mutation. We know it's not caused by a mutation. It's caused by these little cysts, uh, these little um, parasites called trematodes, forming cysts in the developing limb bud, and it diverts development in such a way that you end up with this form rather than the normal limb form. Okay. So we know how this comes about. It's not genetic. It's environmental if you want to make that distinction. I don't feel comfortable with that distinction either, but for all intents and purposes, it's not a mutation. Here are Abigail and Brittany Hensel. This is dicephalus, extreme form of dicephalus. One of only, perhaps, they live in Minnesota, one of only 
uh, two or three in recorded history that have lived as long as they have. Um, you may have seen them on People magazine covers and whatever. People magazine was a very important <laughs> magazine for this. Um, we don't really know the cause of this. Okay, it's presumed to be genetic. Probably is not. Here's an animal where we know what the cause is. This is a British grass snake. Same exact condition. But these animals, it comes out of these animals not because of the mutation, but because the eggs are laid in compost heaps. And when those compost heaps are too warm and the eggs are too hot during incubation, a certain proportion of them develop two heads instead of one. Now, other forms of interchangeability are even more interesting. And when I teach, you know, large introductory classes, I'll say, you know, what is it that makes a male a male, a female a female? And then, you know, 80% of the class will say, males are XY and females are XX. That's like, right, everybody says it. Some people will say, okay, the genitalia are different. And most people today focus on genes. So much so that I ask them, okay, so what's the essence of being a male? What's the essence of being a female? I say, well, genetic difference, chromosome differences. But this ignores us, you know, people are just fixated on that. There has to be a genetic difference for something as evolutionarily important as sex. One of the tenets of evolutionary theory, you have to have a genetic difference, and yet you don't in many species on the planet. Love of geckos. Male and female love of geckos, I show them to you while they're mating. For those of you who are sensitive, you look the other way. The next one, the next one is really, you know, it's really hard to find two alligators. <laughs> Scary. Uh, two turtles. I know, it's, just, it's unbelievable, I feel 30 just talking about it. Um, and, uh, and here are the eggs. Okay, so the question is, I'm just telling you right now, it's a fact. These animals do not have sex chromosomes. They are all genetically, for all intents and purposes, clones, except for the normal variation that happens in other areas. No sex chromosomes whatsoever. How can that be? How could Darwin have allowed it to be this way? <laughs> so how do they do it? Well, it turns out it's temperature. Right? So let's just focus at these. These are the percentage of males hatched in a, in a, in a it's my only graph, uh, of, in, a, in, a, in a clutch. So here are the many turtles. 100% at low incubation temperatures are males, and they go to warmer temperatures, and they go down to females. There are other patterns. They go the opposite way, and some of the males are at the intermediate temperatures, and the females are at the low temperatures to the high temperatures. No sex chromosomes at all. You wonder about the effects of global warming, changes in ecological patterns? It's going to have a huge impact on these animals because what are they going to do when they don't have the right range of temperatures in which to, and it's a short, it's a small range of temperatures, in which to generate the diversity in gender? Some of these animals obviously are just going to go viral. So, to go, you know, the, the final point I want to make has to do with this notion of inheritance. You know, going back to Francis Galton, wrote this book in 1869. This is my copy. It's signed by a guy by the name of Lushington, who, uh, who is actually, his family is mentioned in the book. I imagine all people in Britain whose people were, were mentioned in the book were, wanted to be in this book because this was all about famous people of Britain. Families, judges having children who were judges, and doctors having children who were doctors. And Galton's method was just to collect all of the relationships among people and say, look, smart people have smart children. And dumb people have dumb children, and it's all hereditary. This is the beginning of the nature-nurture debate. In fact, Francis Galton invented the terms nature and nurture. And we still live with it, right? We still live with this false dichotomy between nature and nurture. And the point of developmental systems, one theory is, is to think about inheritance is more than that. And really, this is what Darwin, what Darwin would have thought anyway. I mean, Darwin got co-opted by lots of ideas, and this was one of them. And an, an organism inherits a wide range of resources, right? The environment matters too. What you inherit from your parents matters. Whether you are a person or a beaver being raised near a body of water, right? It's going to matter where you are born and how you live. And that's going to not only affect what behaviors you can express, it's going to affect how you actually develop. Now, I don't have time to go into all the ways that we know that that's true, but it is true. Inheritance is more than just genes. Evolution is more than just population genetics. So my take home message <laughs> is that if we only study the archetypes of each species and promote every human invention as the product of an insightful mind, we feed the same illusion and the snares of opponents of intelligent design. If we truly wish to move beyond designer thinking, we have to accept and confront all the ways that it intrudes upon our understanding of bodies, brains, and behavior. Let me end on one small comment. I think this is, this is 
fairly you know, important. There was a, 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 a woman by the name of Rachel Warden who was uh, the, the former director, she's late now, of the Moody Museum in Philadelphia, a wonderful museum of, of, of um, well, malformations, really, and it's in Philly, and I, if you're ever in Philly, if any of you ever been to the movie? If you ever go to Philadelphia, go to the Union Museum, it's an amazing place. And she talks in this, uh, in this, in this documentary that I saw some years ago um, about a photograph uh, depicting a young girl born with malformed legs who walked just like Johnny Eck on her hand. And she says, I love this little girl. This is what she looks like. So this is what Johnny Eck would have looked like naked. I mean, these are the legs. And this is the arm length. You can see why hand walking is such a natural thing for them. She goes on. She says she has this wonderful, straightforward, unaffected look at the camera. She's totally unselfconscious. And yet she has this extraordinary body with the deficiency of the lower limbs. You don't get the sense of any deformity and certainly not disability. She's perfectly able. She goes on. Warren recalls a photograph of the same girl that was not displayed in her museum and is not shown in the documentary. It shows her in a steel and leather prosthesis. It's sort of a bucket that goes around her hips. And then she has steel legs with little shoes on them. And all of a sudden, she looks like a cripple. The point is that we have these preconceptions about how nature is supposed to be. We have preconceptions about how nature is suppo it's how it's supposed to work. And, and when we, it's ex this is an extreme form of it, because when you see a small child, and she has you know, this obvious deformity, you want to help her. You want to make her more like the rest of us, right? You want to give her those legs that are keeping her behind. But I showed you that film of Johnny Eck. He was not. He was, he was, he was, he was athletic. He was graceful, more graceful than most of us. But we have this, such strong preconceptions about how this stuff is supposed to work, how nature is supposed to work, that we impose it on nature. We take our preconceptions. We take what we've learned about creationism and intelligent design, which are embedded in us no matter how evolutionary we may think our thinking is, and we impose it on the natural world. We impose it on the way we think about human invention and human interaction. And I think that's really ultimately the level. If we want to be evolutionists, we have to strive to get past that and to look for the real sources of the, of the processes that give rise uh, to our natural and technological world. Thank you. <laughs>
history. I mean, that's that's that's. I, I, that's I don't want to argue degrees, and scholarship. I worked with uh, with Domshansky. I worked with Ayala. Yeah. Um, Good people. <laughs> who who uh, had yeah. ideas like these? They had, and I'm, I'm, but that's my so, point. My point is that these ideas were there, but they were suppressed to a large degree by the by the mainstream evolutionary uh, um, uh, populace. That's just that's true, and that's. The reason why Evo Vivo now is so popular is because it's been reformulated in the, in the language of genetics. But that's just because people buy genetics more than they bought embryology. This is something about which we'll disagree. Good. I don't like disagreeing. All right. Yes. Um, Conrad Lorenz had his work, which pretty well showed uh, genetic imprint. Conrad Lorenz had his work, which showed pretty well genetic imprinting of uh, geese and the first thing they saw when they hatched there. Uh, first of all, would you say imprinting is in a appropriate term for any mammalian behavior? And did you really, would, would you like the term instinct for any mammalian behavior? Well, I wrote a book about instinct, and so I care a lot about that issue. The word instinct is hopelessly, hopelessly destroyed of all meaning at this point. It's got at least seven or eight different definitions that people don't even bother to define it when they use it. I would reformulate the way you characterize Conrad Lawrence by saying that you know, he, he argued genetically about things that he had studied, but most of Lawrence's ideas are now largely, you know, are being undone. Uh, so imprinting turns out to be much more complicated than Lawrence thought, uh, because Lorenz was a dyed in the wool genetic programming kind of a guy. Let me give you an example of the type of work that takes us to another level. Uh, a fellow who died, a colleague of mine who died just a few years ago, Gilbert Gottlieb, did a classic experiment looking at not the visual imprinting, there's a whole other story about that which I could talk about, mm -hmm. but auditory imprinting. Duckling comes out of the out of the egg, and it hears the maternal call, and it runs towards that uh, mom, and you have a you have this this sort of collection of young based upon its call. You say, well, the chicks have just come out of the egg, and the mother calls, and the chicks go to it. Obviously, that's an instinct. Well, no. It turns out that eggs, while they are still while the embryos are still in the egg, vocalize. When they get their heads out of the out of the liquid, the fluid inside of the of the egg into an airspace, they begin to vocalize. And eggs are, of course, hatched in groups, uh, or are incubated in groups. And these eggs are vocalizing. They vocalize for lots of reasons, but we don't have to go into that. The thing is that hearing those vocalizations of other ducklings in the egg matter for whether or not they express the response to the mom when they are hatched. If you devocalize them while in the egg. You open the egg, you devocalize them, you close the egg, you let them hatch. They don't show the 